So uh, these are yields. I don't know the colours. The colours don't work. Oh well. Uh, so the, for, for maize, this is uh, growth rates of crop yields uh, uh, for, uh, for the world as a whole. Uh, and so for maize, it was 2.2% per year up until 1990, and then 1.7% per year after that. For wheat, 2.95, then 0.5. Rice, 2.2, then 1. Soybeans uh, fell again. So, so for each of these crops, for the world as a whole, productivity growth since 1990 was slower than before. Uh, if you look just at the high-income countries, uh, the story is worse. It's got a bigger slowdown uh, in every case. Uh, if we look at the middle-income countries, not so bad. They include China, Brazil and India, the places that are, are doing a little better. And for the low-income countries, they had very low productivity growth to begin with, so we've actually got some acceleration of productivity growth in some of those places. Okay. General story, though, in the world as a whole, especially in the high-income countries, a slowdown in crop yield growth. If we look at uh, now total output per, per unit of land or per unit of labour, similar story. In the world as a whole, uh, land productivity fell, growth, the growth rate fell from 2% before 1990 to 1.8 after that. Labour productivity grew faster. That's because labour is getting out of agriculture. You, you can get it with the numerator or the denominator. But if you take China out of the, the world and take the whole world excluding China, then we've got the growth rate of both land and labour productivity slowing down after 1990. If you take out China and the former Soviet Union, you, you counteract that a little bit because they had the opposite experience from China. But the general story is, uh, is of a slowdown with the exception of China. Latin America is another exceptional story, particularly Brazil's driving things there. Uh, Throughout Asia, uh, it looks like Asia's okay, but when you take China out, it doesn't look as good. Africa doesn't look so good. Another way to cut it is by income category of countries, and here you can see that uh, uh, it's the high income countries in particular, there's been a problem with uh, land productivity growth. Now this is the map of the United States uh, showing before 19, uh, uh, rather showing the whole period 1949 to 2002. The average productivity growth rate was 2.02 per cent per year. This is a very good measure of productivity. It's, it's measuring the output uh, of, of all of agriculture and then the inputs where we've adjusted for the quality of the land, we've adjusted for irrigation, we've adjusted for the educational status of farmers. We've done everything we can think of to, to leave uh, a measure of productivity that's attributable to innovation. Uh, and, and, uh, and so there it is. It was around 2 per cent per year up until 1990. It's about 1% per year since. Very consistent with what we see in, in crop yield growth. Right. So another way to think about productivity is to, to look at prices. And, uh, and in fact, uh, for, for weird economists like me, uh, uh, people look at the terms of trade of farmers and say, that's a measure of profitability. And I say, turn it upside down, it's a measure of productivity. Uh, and actually it is, formally. Uh, and so, so we can look at this graph and it says, uh, uh, and some people think that, that they have a short memory and they think uh, farm commodity prices go down all the time. Well, they don't. Uh, and even in secular terms, they don't. Uh, so this, these are indexes for rice, soybeans, wheat and maize. These are US dollar prices deflated by the CPI. Uh, but they're, they're measures of the world price. We could have deflated by something else. It's about the same story if we use other more sensible deflators. Uh, but we look at it, was, these prices were around 100. The index was 100 in 1924. After a fair bit of movement, we get to after the price spike in the 1970s and it's around 100 again. Since then, they fell very rapidly. Uh, and, uh, uh, but if you look at that graph and you draw lines through it, you can say, well, it fell rapidly, especially in the 1970s and the 1980s, but after that, it wasn't falling as fast. And, uh, and before we got to the price spike of, of, of the late 2000s, uh, it was already flat was flattening out. It kicked up at the end, but it was already flattening out before then. And, and, and that shows up in these numbers in the table, that the, the, the prices were falling at th three or four or more percent per year through 1990, uh, and then between 1990 and 2005, they were falling at a much slower rate. And then since 2000, they've been rising in some cases. Uh, so this is another indicator for me of a slowdown in productivity. Before the commodity uh, price spikes in, in 2007 and so on, we already had evidence of a slowdown in the rate of fall of prices, the rate of productivity growth. So, so this is some, 
it's really important. These price declines are really important for people's well-being. Uh, and uh, so it's really important when we think about the world food equation to know what's going to happen next and, uh, and, and what that depends on. So we've got options. So, so I could be giving this talk in Washington, D.C. In fact, I gave one just like it. Uh, and uh, and, and, and uh, it's easier there. There are a lot of easier targets. But we've got one choice is to do nothing, business as usual. And, uh, and the first observation of that is it's a wasted opportunity. All of our evidence says there's a really high rate of return to investing in agricultural R&D. Uh, doing nothing is just uh, uh, wasting that opportunity. Uh, by the way, if we do nothing and waste that opportunity, something else will happen. Uh, China and India and Brazil and other places are not doing nothing. And so uh, our slower rate of productivity growth compared to theirs will mean that eventually we cease to be competitive with them. And so uh, there, there's a selfish reason as well as a, 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 an altruistic reason for being concerned about these things. Um, so the answer, uh, I say, uh, something we can do. There are lots of things we can't do much about. We can do something about this. We could reinvigorate investments in agricultural R&D. Uh, in the United States, uh, the, the, the USDA budget under the Farm Bill uh, is uh, around $120 billion. Uh, and uh, anybody care to guess how much they spend of that on agricultural R&D? Two. Uh, uh, it's, it's negligible compared to what they spend on crop insurance, farm commodity programs, uh, and it's, it's, it's not even noticeable relative to what they spend on food and nutrition programs. So a small rebalancing of that budget towards R&D uh, uh, double it, you know, uh, we, we, you wouldn't notice it in the rest of it. Uh, and then within the agriculture budget we could think about uh, priorities for spending that money and whether to spend it on, on biofuels or uh, uh, the other aspects of the environment or uh, food and nutrition or, or farm productivity. Uh, the other thing we could do is uh, develop policies to encourage the private sector to do more. Uh, we could, uh, so I tell the, the Americans, look the Australians have got the great model, this is what you should be doing. Set up uh, a, a levy funding arrangement uh, put in a matching grant because we've got levy funding arrangements in the United States and they don't generate any money and they don't spend the money on research. You need the matching support from the federal government or it doesn't work. And so it's very interesting to me in a place like this where we have this world's ideal model and people are saying, gee, let's change that. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Uh, the other thing we can do is uh, uh, strengthen intellectual property rights to encourage the private sector. And from a farmer point of view, that has a different implication. If we use endpoint royalties to find, fund crop improvement research, then somebody who owns those varieties is getting the benefits instead of the farmers. And so there's a really different implication in the long run about the returns, who gets those returns uh, as well. So we should pay attention to that. That's it for me. These uh, sources are all available uh, if you want to, to see more about these things. And, and if anybody wants to chase me up, I'm happy to, to interact on them. That's my email. Thank you.